when I was at nursery school, um, the teachers used to find me, I turned the tricycle on its side and I was spinning the wheel and I was watching the sun on the spokes. And I was, and I was fascinated by the light coming off the spokes. And I was actually tested for sort of narcolepsy and epilepsy because people thought I was, you know, there was something happening to me. And in fact, it was just that I was transfixed by the way light worked. up in Brighton and Brighton at that time was quite a magical place because it was an old style seaside resort but it also had another side to it. There were very interesting bookshops, um, there was the two piers and those piers at that time had um, Victorian amusements and included in those amusements were things like these penny tableau which was like a box and you put a penny in and you could see the miser's dream played out with models where the miser would be in bed and the door would open and a skeleton would come out and the miser would look sit up in fright and they also had the what is, used to be called what the butler saw machines which were machines where you put a penny in and you looked down a a sort of eyepiece and you turned a handle and it had literally had a book like a rolodex like the old-fashioned rolodex and it was a series of still images, photographed, all put together and held a, like a flip book. And you could look in there and you could see Jack Dempsey, at one minute from the Jack Dempsey fight, the famous fight. Or you could even have slightly more risque stuff, which was the, called the artist model. And this was an artist in full sort of artist gear. These were all shot round about the, you know, 1910. And the model had her back to us um, and didn't appear to be wearing much. And slowly she would turn to look at the camera. But just before you saw anything, the, the, the thing would finish. But what was great for me was I began to understand how images can be made to move. Because you could see the mechanism through these things. And also the pier had a slatted floor, um, presumably to let rainwater through. And I noticed that if you walked all the way out to the end of the pier and just looked straight down, that the sea would appear to freeze because essentially the floor became a shutter. So I was beginning to sort of, I don't know what it was, there was something that was resonating with me. Um, and my first camera was when I was 12. I saved up my money and bought a beautiful uh, Czech Czechoslovakian camera when it was behind the Iron Curtain, which I still have. Um, and I started shooting standard eight films in my bedroom and then with school friends. So that's really how it all started. I got promotion in the BBC fairly early. I was a camera assistant to begin with. And the, the, the BBC at that point, um, virtually everything was shot on film, despite what history now tells you, that it was all shot in television centre with men going, coming to camera through. Because these cameras were vast. And if you wanted to take them out, it had to become an outside broadcast, which would take three days to set up. And it was the kind of thing they did racing on or whatever. So everything was shot on film and then transferred via telecines out to the public. And to make this happen, the BBC took a lease on the old Ealing Film Studios. And by the time I joined as a trainee, they had 70, 70 permanent film crews working out of there. And they had an operations room that looked like the bunker in Westminster where they directed the planes from. You had walls of every all our names and we could see where we were going next and also you had to travel at a moment's notice they kept you jabbed up um, you had to work on everything from current affairs not news but current affairs music and arts schools programming open university uh, drama you name it if it couldn't be shot in the studios at television center you worked on it so you were given a very broad training. And, you know, sometimes you'd be an assistant to a really bad cameraman. But, of course, if you've got enough up here, you can learn from what not to do or how not to behave. 
And of course, there were other cameramen who were just brilliant, who were really stretching the boundaries, especially in music and arts and drama and in documentary. As an assistant, you were watching. But as an assistant too, I mean, in those days, you, if you travelled abroad, it would be you and a cameraman, as a, if you, as you as an assistant and, and your cameraman, and the cell man. And your job as the assistant cameraman was to get the stuff onto the plane, off the plane at the other end, into the truck or the car, and to handle loading the cameras with 10 minute rolls of film and getting that stuff off every night back to London for processing. And this was pre-EU, and it's probably what we're going to bloody go back to now, is you also had these documents called carnets, where every single item that you were carrying was listed and had to be approved by customs coming into a country and then going out. To make, the idea was to make sure you hadn't sold it without customs duty. So it was a pretty good job. You learnt a lot. You know, A, you were being thrown into situations, sometimes terrible situations. You know, uh, a Palestinian uh, uh, refugee camp in southern Lebanon, under fire from Israelis, or you'd be um, having lunch with Sir William Walton, Walton on his, ma his mansion on Ischia, served with manservants serving you. So it was every kind of experience. My first breakthrough was I shot a series called Hospital. And it, the idea was that um, I would go up to Bolton for three months and they, I was still an assistant, but they gave me a younger assistant to work with. And so essentially it was called making up. They made you a cameraman for the, for the three months. We shot eight films, eight 45 minute films about a hospital. And that included a really deep examination of what was wrong with the NHS. So nothing new there. I was with a very good director, a young director. And he said, I want 45, I want, I want, I want eight absolutely individual 45 minute films and he said in the middle of it I want to give you as the cameraman five minutes to express yourself visually which will only have music over it so up we went and you were, were not allowed to use lights you had to use the lenses of the time which were much slower than they are now and you were shooting on 16 millimeter film which was much slower than digital now is now and what I decided to do was I wanted each film to look different, even though I didn't. So, you know, he allowed me to, if we were doing, if we were doing geriatrics, I tended to shoot into windows all the time, even if there were flares. When we did paediatrics, I always shot, shot from the side with cross light whenever I could. But also the other area where we had to go was um, A&E, or as it was called, casualty, or A&E, I don't remember. And I'd never been in casualty. Ever. I mean, I've been in a war zone once. And, you know, that was, over, that was pretty terrifying. But to go into casualty, to be in Bolton on a Friday night was an eye-opener. There were two or three times where I had to put the camera down and intervene because a nurse was being attacked. You know, I mean, all things like that. And the first night we were in casualty, waiting and getting to know the staff, um, the ambulance went out and apparently to pick up a little boy who had fallen into a reservoir. When the ambulance men got him out, he'd been in the water for an hour. But the water was cold. So they brought him in, and it was a major effort to try and revive this poor little kid. And my director wasn't there. He was dealing with other issues with, with the hospital. So I had to make a decision, what did I film? And I thought, I'm not going to film a kid who's dying. That's, that's not what this is about. So apart from one very wide shot where you couldn't see anything, I just made a film about what the staff go through, what this is like to try and save a life. And the child did not live. So I was really glad that, you know, I respected that, that decision. I then went back to being an assistant <laughs> and I went off to New Mexico to make a film with a cameraman um, about the first ever Navajo nuclear fission expert in, 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 in Los Alamos. And unbeknownst to me, the series had... The first episode had gone out and people had never seen anything like this on television before. And it caused a furore, which I had no idea it had, except... The next day, I think we were on, I was on the phone to London just telling them when to expect some film. 
And they said, oh, could you hang on? The camera manager would like to speak to you. So I thought, oh, God, what have I done? And basically, he told me, he says, when you come back, you've got a job as a cameraman. And I said, well, why? He says, well, we can't have an assistant cameraman probably be gonna, winning prizes. The hospital series uh, won every prize going that year. The nursing sister in casualty became an MBE because of it. And so suddenly, I was sort of in a different sphere. Suddenly, I wasn't putting my hands in a changing bag anymore. Um, I was now had a chance to... To, to sort of create my own material. So that's how that started. I was then put out onto programmes like Nationwide, which were, is the way you sort of work your way up the scale. Um, and then they came to me and said, well, you've done hospital, you know how to deal with difficult stuff. And I had films, you know, operations and things as well. And they said, we have this film coming up and it's about a change of sex. Would you be interested? And I said, absolutely. I did have an ability to get on with people. I never judge people. I always just try and find out what, who are they. Because I think if you prejudge, as if, if you're shooting, uh, the danger is you kind of lay your own experiences or even prejudices, because we all have prejudices one way or the other. Um, so you, you, you have to really try and see yourself as someone who finds out about people. I had worked on an arena as an assistant. A, a film that I recently put up uh, about the Japanese outfit called Tenjo Sajiki, who were performing in Amsterdam. And I just operated the B camera on it, but I got to know Nigel Finch, the director, and we kind of, we, we bonded. Partly over birth dates, we were very close in our birth dates, and Nigel had gone to university and done, done his arts degree. I had left school when I was 16. So we were very different people from that point of view, but what he was able to do was we would go to galleries together if we weren't shooting and he was able to give me to really start to um, crystallize what I was already discovering about painters and artists and what I was able to give him back I think was um, an ability to just when he said oh let's do this there was no question of oh well you know oh you I would just wade in and do it and we had an unspoken language when I became a, a cameraman, suddenly he was able to ask for me, even though that wasn't quite the way the BBC always liked it. And it allowed me to have a programme or a strand of programmes where I was happiest, and I was happiest when I was dealing with other creative people, however that creativity was there. In the end, you know, I did films about Remand at Brixton, you know, and... As interesting as it is to do that stuff, it wasn't for me. You know, Brixton really did upset me. You know, I mean, I, 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 I almost, I mean, I did have a, almost a crack up after five weeks in that bloody place, day after day, just looking at the human misery there. Um, whereas the one thing you didn't do is feel like you're cracking up if you're working with William Burroughs or whoever. With Bill, I mean, you know, I, I, I think I shot two or three films with him in the end. I was the go-to person in the UK if Bill was there, there because I understood him. When I was in New York and we shot the, 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 the Burroughs film, there was a scene, we did do a scene in, in, the, in, the, in the armory room that he had with all the weaponry, with him firing live rounds and no one else would go in there. The sound recorder said, I'm not going in there. And I just said to Bill, don't shoot me. You know, he shot his, his, his wife accidentally, but on purpose. So he said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> there is an interesting arena, which is uncut footage of a conversation between him and Francis Bacon. And arena put it out as uncut footage. And I've used it a couple of times now, lecturing to cinematography students about what you as a cameraman have to provide the editor with and how you must be listening to what's being said, but you don't always have to film what's being said. Sometimes what's more interesting is what is the listener doing? So it's a kind of almost a stream of conscious film for me. It sort of shows my thought processes. But, you know, I got on with Bacon very well. I did two films with Bacon. Um, and again, I, I, I adored his work. I loved his work. But also, I just, by that point, I understood who these people were and to be with them and to be around that, that situation is just enriching. There is a film that we shot for Arena uh, with Lena Lovitch, who was a stiff artist, 
That was when I was still at the BBC. And, you know, we went to Berlin to shoot that. And we went to Berlin when it was Berlin, when it was, had a wall and it was surrounded by, East, you know, by, by communist blocks. One night I was in the car with Lena and, and, and her, her, her husband stroke uh, uh, bassist and I think we were driving down the autobahn out of Berlin. I think we were heading to the airport. So I just got in the car with them. And, you know, suddenly Lena says, oh, it'd be interesting to get off and just take, take a turning off and go into East Germany, you know. And we did. Late at night, we sort of turning off and we showed our passports and they looked at Lena, who dressed always the way she looked, with bows in her hair and lace and, you know, heavy goth makeup. And the guards just took one look at her and asked for her autograph. Not because they knew her, but they thought, dressed like that, she's got to be famous. And we finally found this dreadful sort of fluorescent lit eatery with sort of people looking at us as we walked in. And, um, you know, everything on the menu was off. <laughs> it was East Germany. Um, and I think we had sausages. That's all they had. And then we got back in the car and drove back in onto the main motorway and went back into the West again. What happened with that was the Lena Lovitch film had been seen by the commissioning, the, the, by, the, by, I can't remember her name now, whoever it was who commissioned videos for Virgin, for music. And she was the big honcho. You know, she was the one who handed out the jobs. She said there are three names here on a bit of paper. They run the three companies in London that do most of the music videos. Tell them they have to see you. And mention my name. And one of them was an outfit called Aldabra, which became Working Title. And I walked in, and I walked in cold. And there was a real sort of, who are you? Well, and I said, I can wait to see somebody. And she said, oh, I have to talk to somebody. This is a receptionist. And I sat there for about 10 minutes, and I like sitting in receptions because you can gauge what a company's like, whether it's corporate, whether it's more bohemian, you can get a good sort of sense of it. And the door burst open, and in walked this guy twirling his hair, and he looked at me and said, who the fuck are you? And I said, I'm Mike Southern. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a cinematographer. He said, oh yeah, what have you done? And I said, arena. He says, I love arena. Come into the office. And it was Bernard Rose. Uh, he said, OK, I've got a video next week, not much money. It's a singer called Anne Pigol. And we went into the East End of London when it was really still nice and gritty. And it was, you know, he had this scenario, which was skinheads. She was a stripper. And skinheads were going to come in in slow motion and spray her with beer, you know. And again, it didn't, you know, I didn't sort of go, oh, you know. We shot it, and it was a very, very good video. And we got on like a house on fire. And the following week, my answering service said, oh, uh, Bernard Rose has been on the phone to see your availability. He's got another video. And um, I said, oh, yeah, yeah, great, love to do it again. So he said, well, have a meeting, go in. I went in and it was Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And it was Pleasure Dome. And I was told there was no real budget. In other words, we could spend what we wanted because Relax had, uh, had worked so well for Bernard and for the company. So we went into Pleasure Dome and it was a full 35mm shoot, not 16mm. Studios, choppers, uh, real aircraft searchlights, front projection, and it's a bloody good video. And, and there we were both channeling Fellini because we both love Fellini. So the whole, the whole thing is very Fellini-esque. And before I know, knew it, I was getting six potential bookings a week and my service was beginning to struggle. So that's when they, uh, they suggested I got an agent and the agent started sifting these offers and finding out who was real and who wasn't. And actually, just from the other point of view, understood that I wasn't charging enough. Um, it has to be remembered that then that music videos were shooting extremely long hours. Um, when, when, when some of the George Michael shoots, we went on for 32 hours non-stop. The thing is, you had to move fast. That was the first thing. Secondly, you always operated your camera yourself. Whereas if you were doing a bigger movie, you'd have a camera operator, to, to, you know, because it's just too much to handle on a bigger movie. So you were instantly, you, you were connected with it. I think, I think creative adrenaline is a very, very powerful drug. I think it can give you um, all kinds of resilience. And it also just kind of... Uh, I don't, I, it's very hard to put a, put a, you know, it's very hard to verbalise about what goes on. But essentially, 
a lot of the time, you know, the director's saying, well, I don't know what to do here. I've got the drum kit to do it, and it's three in the morning. And the drummer wants to go home. So you have to sort of think, OK, and you don't want to do what you saw in the last video or what you did. So you're constantly thinking about new ways of doing things, knowing that generally, as long as, to use the phrase, as long as it comes out, and as long as what you're doing is not safe, then you're, it will be interesting. And there is something about shooting to music. It's a very, very um, satisfying medium. The adrenaline was fantastic. And if you were shooting a live gig, you know, I always used to like to take the camera in the pit because, A, you were very closely connected with your main artists because they tended to be near the front. Secondly, the viewfinders were not that good when they were pointing straight into lights. So you were doing a lot of guesswork as well. You were, you were working on what you knew worked. And even though you might not see much because you were getting flares in the viewfinder, it was exciting. And, you know, if you were going up and down on that pit camera on a dolly, although the grips was pushing you, your focus puller had their feet up and you were actually swinging the focus puller as well, using a foot rest. So it was like a workout. So at the end of like a two-hour two George Michael gig, we did one of the big ones in Paris in the big stadium. I mean, we, I, I, we were as exhausted as George was because we had been going up and down for two hours in the heat. And with one director in particular, Andy Morahan, you know, I mean, I, I remember the first time I worked with a new grip and as opposed to my regular grip, and he said, excuse me, Governor, could I have a word? And I said, yeah. He says, I notice you're tapping your foot. You realise that's shaking the camera? I said, absolutely. <laughs> That's what I wanted. I wanted there to be an internal rhythm, a, a, a very subtle judder from the camera. Within Aldabra at that time, there was a young producer called Luke Rogue, who was producing for Bernard Bros. And Luke was Nick Rogue's, one of Nick Rogue's son. And Luke is still a producer. And Luke is the, is the boy in Walkabout. At the same time, um, there had been an inquiry, very thing from um, Virgin, the, the people on the feature side uh, to the music video side about DPs to do a very low budget picture called Captive, which was being directed by Paul Mayersberg, who had written two pictures for Nick Rogue. And it was sort of loosely based on the Paddy Hearst story. In other words, it's the Stockholm Syndrome. But it was a pretty um, strung out script, let's put it that way. It, was not, it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna make millions. They said, well, you know, could you meet with, with Paul? I said, absolutely. And it wasn't like going to a grubby office. It was, there's a, you know, there was a French restaurant. You used to have Flaming's things outside in Soho, very old style French restaurant. And they said, Paul would like to meet you there. And I, I like food. I love my food and I like cooking. So I thought, couldn't be a better place than that. And it was a very, it was a, a, quite a bibless lunch. I mean, Paul knew his wines and didn't hold back on, on getting something good. It was never cheap plonk, you know. And we got on and we didn't really talk about the film. I think the script had only just come to me that morning and I hadn't had a chance to do more than, you know, flick it. But we got on. I don't know, again, it was about connections or just finding that we were interested in the same things, whether it was opera which was interesting me at that time we went away and my agent came back and said look they, they're offering you the job and this was my first picture my first movie and this was the thing the breakthrough i'd wanted because if you did music videos or if you did commercials and i was doing some commercials as well at that point you didn't do you didn't do feature films i'm sorry but you know this wasn't on um, there was a younger breed of directors like Parker coming up through commercials and Ridley Scott who were ready to start using our kind of DPs, but it was like really quite scary. So they said, so my agent tried, you know, did a deal with them and then the next thing we knew is that Virgin had said, no, you can't have him. Paul's a first time director and so consequently we need to give him someone more old school. And when Luke Rogue heard about this, he spoke to his father, Nick. And Nick Rogue had one look at some stuff I'd done for Bernard. Luke had talked to him and he, did, he rang Virgin up and he said, look, I'll tell you what, take this guy on. If he screws up in the first week, I'll come on and I'll shoot the movie for free. 
we went on and we shot it in a deserted old warehouse that before it, before all dockland was was developed um kubrick was shooting eyes wide shot across the water from us so we were constantly getting his shitty smoke from all the burning tires coming across us and within this warehouse most of it the film was shot there we created this film and paul just said shoot it the way you would feel you want to shoot it you know, paul was more interested in in getting these um, rather surreal performances from and it was a it was a french language a french english french co-production and it was also produced by don boyd who had just been allowed back into the film industry because he'd paid all his debts off he'd done an earlier an earlier film i think it, it wasn't called scandal or something like that and at the last minute, his French money had pulled out and he was left with a huge debt. And he was banned by the union from working. So, you know, Don was back in the business. And Don was, he had one of the first big mobile phones, you know. And Don was brilliant. He understood the business. He understood the guarantors. And Don was so giving in terms of me telling him, don't, you know, watch your lighting bill. Because they'll be looking at what your bill is and what you're actually using. He gave me so many good tips, you know. And every Friday, he would get the drivers to take Paul and out ice. He'd take us up to some, the many clubs that he, he had membership of in Soho. And he'd order drinks and then he'd walk away and said, you get on with it and make sure there was a driver for both of us to take us home at the end of every week. He was a fantastic producer. Then the news came through that would I take a meeting with Ken Russell? And there's a back history because Dante's Inferno was the first film I'd seen on television, which was the film about Rossetti. And I'd seen it late night on, I think it was just when Omnibus was starting, when it went from Monitor to Omnibus. And the film transfixed me. It turned, and this is when I was probably 15, 14. And that's what fired up my interest in, in the Gothic, in the whole business of laudanum and the mind-altering aspect of drugs. Um, it got me interested in art in a big, big way. I wanted to know what all this was about. And, of course, the Rossetti story is just extraordinary. There he does, you know, five years after Lizzie's died, Lizzie Siddle's died, he has her dug up so he can take the poems out of the coffin that, she, that, that he threw in when she died. You know, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic story. And Dante's Inferno was a black-and-white film shot by a great cameraman. I think, I think it was Nat Crosby who was someone who I admired at the BBC Ealing. So I went in, and I went into Ken's uh, apartment in Baker Street, and um, said, oh, come in, come in. You know. And, you know, there was this, this whole apartment was had L L vinyl, wall-to-wall -wall vinyl, every wall. Ken's record collection, and it was all classical music, was exemplary. And his, his knowledge of classical music was extraordinary. And what is not actually known about Ken is that all of the early recordings by Arnold Bax, the English composer, were financed by Ken. No one knows that. I think that's the first time I've told anyone that. But he paid for Arnold Bax's compositions to be recorded by big companies like EMI. So we got talking and I said, I'm not going to brown nose you, Ken, but I've got to, I'm meeting you and we may never meet again, I've got to tell you about Dante's Inferno. So I told him that. And he, he was, Ken actually was a very modest man. I know that may not seem his public persona. But he said, oh, really? He couldn't believe, you know, he, he, it's that power of what, what television can do. And bearing in mind, as I said, I left school at 16 with, with, no, with three, oh, three O levels. You know. You know, I wasn't, but he had fired me up. So we talked again about lots of things. I talked about my, you know, by this, by this point I'd been reading, I'd read Shelley's Frankenstein, I'd read Bram Stoker. My teacher had introduced me to Edgar Allan Poe because of my interest in things. He then put, gave, my English teacher then gave me Daphne du Maurier because the birds had been turned into a film by Hitchcock. So he thought I'd read du Maurier because it was horror. And of course he was really pushing me into literature. And so I got the job. And he saw Captive, he said, I hate the film, he says, but your work's brilliant. So um, we, we had sort of some pre-production and then his reputation at this point when we did Gothic was, was notorious. You know, he'd done the Strauss film for the BBC, which the BBC had banned. You know, we'd had The Devils 
um, which my, one of my closest friends, Judith Parrish, was 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 one of the nuns in it. You know, um, and she was part of actually part of Ken's sort of regular team of uh, uh, performers. Um, so we all went up to the Lake District. He liked to lead the crew and everyone on the crew a merry dance. He liked to push people to the limits. He needed to push people to the limits to fight, to get them, to, to make sure he didn't have any weak links when he was making them. And, let, and, and this will probably come into what we talk about a replicant a bit later. You know, most directors have to have a very ruthless streak. However nice they can be, you have to be ruthless to get what you want. And he knew that with Gothic, he didn't have much time. I think it was a six-week schedule. And so he wanted to push, push, push. Now, what he got was Malcolm, Malcolm Sheehan, my grips, who I work with all the time. Um, I had Steve Parker, who had focus pulled for a lot of um, um, uh, 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 music videos with me. But also was a great, who knew people in the film industry as well, in the, in the feature film industry. I just, Ken wanted to operate. We had to institute a system whereby um, Steve would look through the camera and he'd pan right and he'd pan left. And when, when, he's got a, when there was a light in shot, he'd make a mark on the head. Whilst we were shooting, he could look at that mark on the head and tell Ken, Ken, you've just gone into a light. So I had a good crew. And this was a music video crew. And whatever Ken threw at us, it didn't faze us. He's all, he was always used to having people trying to keep up with him. And our philosophy was, no, Ken, we're going to make you keep up with us. <laughs> Ken's other thing he told me was, I always want to see into the actor's eyes. It doesn't matter how dark it is, he said. I always want to see in their eyes. And I knew what he meant. And I had a simple solution, which was the Obi light, which was first done for Merle Oberon in the, in, the, in the 30s in Hollywood, which is a small light above, right above the lens, which you keep there. And I had a series of wires that I could put in so I could have hardly any light coming out of it or I could have loads. And that was, that was when on film sets you had to ask, you had to request over time. And you could you could agree before lunch to have a two-hour overtime in the evening. And whether you used it or not, you paid for it. In other words, the crew got paid. And there was this financial pressure, but he knew he couldn't get, get do all the work uh, in, on, in this stately home. And he knew he needed more time. So they put in the overtime request and they got it. Um, and it was with a young actress, Miriam Sear, and um, Gabriel Byrne had to push her towards an open fire, which was a blazing log fire. He didn't just want gas, he wanted blaze. And she had to spew out white pasta because of the, the white meal that Byron, you know, the white, this whole business with, with white food. And she just wasn't able to deal with it. And Ken was getting more and more frustrated. So he kept, he was frustrated with himself, but he kept saying, oh, there's not enough light in her eyes. And I just go, okay, Ken. And I take out one little wire. I say too much, and I put a different one. And this went on and on for about ten minutes. And the real thing is, he just wasn't happy with what it was doing. And basically, he suddenly stood up. And I have to—I mean, this is well known. It's in the big Ken Russell book, and everyone said it. Ken was drinking very heavily at that point. Two bottles at lunchtime of wine, champagne in the morning when he arrived. And by the by five o'clock, he was. He was feeling pretty shitty. He wasn't allowed to drink on the set. But, you know, if you consume that amount of al alcohol, five o'clock at night, if you're not very fit, you know, we all, we've all been there. <laughs> we know what that can feel like. And you don't feel on top of your game. So he suddenly stood up and he said, that's it. It's a wrap. And stormed off the set. And went and drank a bottle. And then got in, got in the driver then took him off. So I thought, OK, that's it. I'm off. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be fired for this. Um, so the next, I expected a phone call that night and didn't get one. Um, the next morning I went in a bit earlier and went onto the set and I made sure I stood in the way of the producers as they came in for the morning. And they just went, hello, Mike. You know, I thought, okay. And then I heard the walkie-talkies squawk, you know, Mr. Rattle, Mr. Rattle's on his way in, <coughs> you know. And that, then I heard the champagne go in his room, the, the assistant pulling the champagne. 
And so I thought I'd better stand, you know, make sure I'm there. And I walked in. I went, morning, Ken. He said, hello. He says, do you like champagne? I said, I love it. So we went in and drank a bottle of champagne together. And I think what it was, was he knew that it wasn't the eyes that I like and the camera. What he, I think he finally also got was that this guy is prepared to argue in a constructive way, but prepared to stand his ground. And it became a fantastic relationship between us and with my crew. He, we would say, Ken, we need another 10 minutes. We can't get this done in time. He said, oh, yeah, of course. And afterwards, Ken was extremely generous to me. Whenever any other director wanted to find out about me, my agent knew to ask them to ring, and Ken would just give me a glowing rapport. And I think it was shown either at the beginning or the end of the London Film Festival, the picture. And there was a QA and a afterwards with Gabriel and the producer and Ken on the stage, you know. And so there were the usual damn fool questions that come up at those things, you know, how did you conceive of this, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, someone said, oh, well, how do you deal with stars? How do you cope with the star personality? And, you know, you just don't ask Ken Russell that kind of thing. But anyway... Um, he just said, well, there's only one star on this picture. And he said, he's in the audience. Stand up, Mike. My, my wife says, you know, I don't remember it. I, I was gone, you know, at this point. Um, I mean, I'm gone in the sense of just, I was so overawed by, this is the first ever time I'd ever been at a premiere. It was only, I think it was film number two. Um, and I stood up and people clapped. I did one other film with Ken, um, which was with uh, Richard Dreyfus which was about the Dreyfus affair, Prisoners of Honour, where Dreyfus was also the producer. Ken had never had to deal with a producer who was in front of his camera before. There were lots of fireworks on that between him and Dreyfus. And that was when Dreyfus himself admits that he was a pretty unpleasant individual. But then he got me for a music video for Phantom of the Opera. Um, and then I, we sort of drifted to, to a degree. And then much closer, I knew from Judith, my friend, that you know, Ken had been ailing and, you know, things were not going well. He was becoming unbankable, uh, despite doing altered states and pictures like that and saving altered state. And the last time I saw Ken was I'd become very big in the BSC, the British Society of Cinematographers, and I had been president. And we had some big dinner. I don't know what the dinner was. I was told, so would you like to sit with Ken Russell? He's one of our guests. And I said, absolutely. I'd love to sit with Ken. Um, and I think it was Alan Parker was the other side of me. <laughs> and by this point, Ken was really not allowed to drink. He ha I think he'd had the first of a series of strokes. And I was a little bit worried that this wasn't going to be the Ken that I, that the Ken that I remembered. I was hoping that he would be able to, um, you know, converse at least. And in fact, he took one look at me and just stood up and went, Mike. And we had this fantastic evening again. That was the last time I saw him. So when Paper House came up, there was no question that I would want to do it with Bernard. I love the script. I just saw so many possibilities in it. And I've always been, again, fascinated by dreams and about that business of what is reality and what isn't. And the ability of cinema to actually, in some way, provide you with some kind of visual bridge into the dream world. So I like that whole thing. Bernard and I, at that point... Both those early pictures, that both Gothic and Captive, and Bernard, we'd never worked at a studio. We'd always had to do it on location. And both of us, like young, like, like so enthusiastic schoolboys, we weren't, but that sort of thing, we both wanted to shoot at Pinewood Studios. So we told Jane Fraser, the line producer, gorgeous Jane, fan, really great line producer. So we said, we want to shoot at Pinewood. And she said, well, we're not going to be able to afford that. So Bernard said, let's, let's see. And again, this was, there was not a lot of work around at the time. And so we went with Jane to Pinewood Studios to meet with the guy who ran it at the time, who was this, this, this guy with a double-breasted blazer with gold buttons on it and an RAF moustache, sort of, you know, one of those, who said, OK, he said, which one of you is the producer? And Jane said, I'm the producer. And he said, what, little you? So you can imagine what we felt about this guy. But we had a tour. We went back to work in title. I think it was work in title at that point. And we both said, we want to do it in a studio. We need the stu control of a studio. 
And there were big issues. There were issues about how do we shoot out on a moor at night in the middle of nowhere, a moor which has ferocious weather, where you can't see into the distance, where the sky is never going to be seen. You know, uh, uh, and even digi I mean, digitally now you can see the sky. You can't, you never see it with film. So we pushed and pushed, and we went back to Pinewood, and Pinewood had two stages which were not, had no chance of being hired out. There wasn't enough work. So they gave us the stages for a very, very good price. So now we had the control of a lighting rig and all the rest of it. We then went down to, I think it was somewhere in Dartmoor, but I, could, I don't quote me on paper on that, um, where we knew that for the daytime stuff, we did actually need to shoot on a real moor and we needed to see the house in the distance. So when we came back from that and we realised that we were dealing with children, so you're talking about limited working hours, we're dealing with special effects, we're dealing with a whole slew of stuff that we need, that we needed to bring the moor to Pinewood, which is what the production did. They got special dispensation from whoever owns all that to cut pieces of the moor up and the deal was we would put them all back exactly afterwards as they were. Um, Gemma, the production designer, who a, a really innovative uh, production designer, uh, worked with horticulturalists to bring the moor into Pinewood in, into the big studio there. We had ultraviolet lights up in the roof, which were turned on at night to feed the moor. We had sprinklers, which would feed the moor at night with moisture, because under, and we were using a lot of big lighting for the daytime sequences. Um, and within a week, it was like the, the Eden Dome. We started spotting livestock. A number of things was we had, you know, biting insects but we also found there were mice there were, it was extraordinary how this thing suddenly became its own world you know um so we shot this at most of it at pinewood apart from our location stuff um down on the moor and it gave us the control because then we could have the ground opening up then we could work out how to do lava flow which was wallpaper paste lit from underneath um you know, it, it gave us the control we wanted. And within the studio environment, of course, you can, you can really control your lighting because you're not dealing with traffic noise. You're not dealing with the sun going up and down. You're not dealing with rain, with wind, with all of those things. It is an atmosphere where the only thing that you have to deal with is how to get that shot. All the other problems are taken away from you. Sometimes you shoot on location, it gives you energy. But on a picture like this, we would not have been able to do what we did um, without shooting it at Pinewood. And we got our wish. We both did our first films at Pinewood, so that was pretty cool. There was candlelight in it, but of course in those days you couldn't do, again, what you can do with digital cameras now. Now, if you want a candle in the middle of a room, you just light a candle and you whack the gain up and you get a very beautiful image. Then if you did that on film, all you'd see is a flame. You know, it a lot of younger film students forget how film was a nightmare in the shadows. Digital, interestingly enough, is the one, th the big advantage it has is you can see down into nothing in terms of luminance. You sometimes have to watch what's going on at the top of the range, but even there, it's very forgiving. I've always been a cinematographer who I don't like lighting that somehow doesn't have some form of motivation, either naturally um, or mentally you can have something happening in a, in a frame because there is something strange going on, so you don't always have to justify your source. And again, Replicant is a perfect example of, I believe that there's not a single frame in that where you don't feel it's, that there's a reason why the light looks like it does. Bernard was just in his element. He was absolutely in his element. He was just so creative on it. It was just a really good experience for everybody. Um, and one of those pictures, when, when they finally called Final Rap, we were, we felt bereaved. We felt as though we had, you know, the, the, the party was over on that one and we didn't want it to stop. The way the work was going, it was really a question of just keep working. You know, there were some big downturns. I was offered another film first that Roger Christian was directing. 
called The Final Cut. It's a bomb disposal picture. And we had worked together. And so I got this call saying, look, Roger would like you to come to Vancouver and shoot this picture. And I, I think um, I, couldn't, I couldn't do the post-production, the pre-production, because I was already on something else. And he said, well, we, he can do the pre-production with a camera operator, and then we'll talk to you every night on the phone. There were no Skype in those days. Um, and we can fax you stuff, you know, set plans. So I said, yeah, I like the script. I hadn't done a script like that before. So um, I remember, I think I finished whatever job I was on, packed the bags, and the following morning flew into Vancouver. I'd been to Vancouver in the, uh, probably 15 years earlier to do a BBC thing called Camera and the Song. And Vancouver at that point was a, you know, it was where all the draft dodgers were. And it was a very hippie place. And I was making a film with a singer and we were living in her house up in North Van, but it was still forest. Sleeping under a piano in a sleeping bag to make this film. I went back to Vancouver, which was just beginning to, something else was happening in Vancouver, you know. Um, there was the beginnings of a property boom. There was all this. And I went in with these, this little outfit, Keystone, run by Robert Vince and Bill Vince. They were very suspicious of me. They wanted a local cameraman. But Roger had insisted. And I think I just, I, I, I went straight onto the set the following morning with jet lag. Roger had talked to me. He said, I really want to shoot everything with two cameras. And I said, absolutely fine. And he said, I want to cross the line a lot with the cameras. And I said, absolutely fine. <laughs> Um, and I said on one condition that we have the operator, I knew who the operator was, he was brilliant, a brilliant young operator. And I said, I want to operate the, the camera. So, you know, and I want to be able to control both in the sense of, I want to be able to lay it down what I want from the other. As it happened, I did two days with this guy and he was so good. After that, we didn't have, we just, we meshed. And we did a lot of shooting across, you know, we broke the rule about, about crossing the line. But what that did was it made the film feel very uneasy. The, the audiences were... And it's, I think it's a really sweaty film. I think mean, it really works, the final cut. Roger had that idea that he wanted... He said, what we've got to do is take someone famous and kill him in the first minute because no one expects the famous one to die. And then if you start crossing the line a lot, the reason you don't cross lines normally is so that the cuts flow. So the audience doesn't feel the cut. The cut works subconsciously, but they don't feel the judder of the cut. If you cross the line, suddenly... And it's done a lot now. But then, of course, nobody was really supposed to cross the line. And what it did was it's pulled the rug from under your feet. And we didn't have much money. And, of course, Bill Vince and Robert Vince saw how I could work. Come in off the plane with jet lag, never went behind schedule. And at the end of it, they said, oh, you know, we'd like to work with you more. Um... So the next thing I know, I get a call about Airbud. Again, I couldn't fly over for a meeting, and they weren't going to pay for me to fly to Vancouver and that. Um, but anyway, Charlie and I spoke on the phone, and we didn't really talk about much, really. We talked about Black Stallion, the picture, and we talked about Lauren Hardy, both of which we were absolute experts on. Those were the two influences we wanted to bring into it. The villains had to be Lauren Hardy, essentially, and Black Stallion is about a boy's relationship to an animal, you know, the bond. And again, it was a beautiful shoot um, with Kevin in the lead, who was an extraordinary uh, actor to have on set. A, 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 a boy who could just do it and could turn any, anything that happened that was unexpected. He didn't sort of look at you and say, or stop. He just put it into the action. I presume Replicant found me through Bill, Bill Vince, because he knew of my reputation. He knew I'd, ne I'd never gone over budget. I'd never, you know, I'd solved a lot of problems at the last minutes of the day. I tended to be someone who shot later than anyone else into the evening. I had ways of having lights ready. So if, you know, as the light was failing, I could always squeeze a couple of close-ups in because I knew how to compensate on the run as the light faded. I, I had sort of systems that I, I put in. And once a gaffer got used to what my game was with that, they knew near the end of the day to start building what I would call our twilight rig, which allows us to shoot into twilight, but still make it look like day. And that came actually from just examining images that I used to take on, on my camera. And then on the computer, 
just seeing what a dark image, even though it looked like Dala, what you needed to do to make it look like daytime. You know, I mean, you couldn't go on forever; it become night. But you could, you could, you could help a production uh, a lot. And a couple of extra shots at the end of the day, or not having to go back to a location the next day, saves a lot of money. I think that's where it came from because you know we have to look at you know Ringo's coming out of essentially Hong Kong and the Hong Kong in industry. Uh, certainly at that point, the director was king in Hong Kong. And as I learnt from Ross, the camera operator, who was Ringo's camera operator, um, that if Ringo or a director decided they didn't want to shoot for a week, then they dismissed the crew for a week and you didn't get paid. That's how it worked over there. If you, if you did wanted to do a 48-hour day, you did it. That's how it worked over there. You know, if you suddenly needed a tower, um, you built it out of, out of bamboo many times, and if it... If it was dangerous, there was no health and safety. That's how the Hong Kong industry worked at that point. It may have changed now, and I don't, can't comment on, on beyond that. But at that time, the director or the producer was king, and everyone else was very subservient to it. And Ringo was coming in to an environment which was unionised, correctly, in my opinion, and where health and safety was an issue. And in my opinion, it should be more of an issue on set. We've still had, you know, even one death a year on a film set is one death too many. Well, the good thing was that they wanted to bring in Ross, who was a DP in his own right, but and a DP stuff for, for Ringo. Ross was a very rough and ready Australian who lived in, who lived in Hong Kong. Um, liked his beer, nothing wrong in that. And then never inter the beer never interfered to, uh, with him on set. Um, he was burly. He would be quite happy to sit on the front of a speeding car with a handheld camera, you know. Um, he, and he'd work with Ringo. And I thought, yeah, I'm not going to fight this. I'm going to go with it because this guy's worked with Ringo. But I'm going to be his, his superior. Oh, no, wrong, wrong word, but you know what I mean. Um, I thought, this is my conduit. So the moment Ross arrived, I took him out for dinner that night to a bloody good restaurant, and I said, OK, spill the beans. Tell me about him, you know. Let me know. Tell me what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, he said, well, you will find that Ringo will try and test you. I said, well, I've been through that a few times, so that doesn't worry me. And he says he will change his mind. And so he says it really helps the DP to be prepared for the change. And again... I think it's a bit like Ken. He had been in a position where he could just say, OK, I want to shoot the other way around. It's not working this way. Which meant he could go away for three hours whilst the crew rejigged. What I realised from early on, that when I was on the big sets, I lit it four ways. So whichever way the camera went, I could, spit, I could just switch off a bank of lights and have another bank on. Bill understood that we wouldn't lose two hours when Ringo wanted to go off and have a phone call or whatever, that the set could be ready very quickly. And I think that surprised Ringo. I remember I, it was during one of the early fight scenes near around that furnace, which we shot early. Um, and Ringo said, no, 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 not working. He says, we go the other way. He says, how long? Two hours? And I, I went to the gaffer. Just to, I wanted to show it, so I went, it went bang, bang. I said, ready, Ringo, when do you want to shoot? And he was a toughie. I mean, I remember the, 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 the famous the fight between, between Jean-Claude and Jean-Claude around the furnace, for instance, a complicated sequence, especially when you're using body doubles, when you're occasionally using motion control, with all of the, the complexities of that. They were just beginning to build the set, so they moved everybody out, and the stunt guy came in, and Ringo said, I'll go show me, you show me what you do. And John Claw came on and this stunt guy began to do, well, you know, I sort of go like this and then I go Oof, like that and then, you know, like that, Oof, like that. And that's how stuntmen talk. They don't actually do it. And Ringo just stormed on the set because he was allowed to smoke, which he weren't allowed to do on sets in Vancouver. So they gave him an ashtray with a fan. So... And he put, the moment he put his cigarette on it, of course, with the fan on, these things would go... So he was constantly having to light up, but it was the only way he was allowed to smoke on the set. 
Ringo threw the cigarette down and immediately there was a grip trying to get it and put it out. So, you know. And Ringo, of course, was a stuntman. That was his background. He, he started off in stunts. And he was fit. You know, he wasn't a young'un anymore, but he was fit. And he beat the shit out of Jean-Claude. And I say that. I mean, he hit him. For real. He knew how to pull, but he didn't avoid contact. And Jean-Claude was from one end of the set to the other. And Ringo did this for about five minutes, and he stood up and said, that's how you show me how to rehearse. And suddenly, stunt department realised this was a whole different game than what they were used to. He knew how to stay the fight. And the good thing was that Ross knew how to operate a camera on a fight. None of the camera operators I knew in Vancouver would have been able to keep up with Ringo and what he wanted. They would have missed moves. Ross had a, a beautifully... He un, he, somehow, he always connected with the action with his camera. He never missed a punch. If someone suddenly went flying, he could be with it. It was actually, again, watching people do their job properly, their craft. The craft of operating is not talked about enough. Now I'm part of a jury that gives best operating awards once a year for both TV and film now. And it's part of the BSC awards thing, a big evening at the Dorchester. You know, a big star-studded thing with directors and everything. And I'm part of a jury because part of my, my, my whole crusade for my life has been to bring to people's attention in the industry how important the operator is and how operating isn't just a question of pointing a camera. It's about how framing affects the feel of a, a shot how headroom can make someone feel oppressed or it can make you feel lightheaded. It's about where you put people in frame. It does, isn't just stick it in the centre and keep it in the centre. And a good operator on a set will solve so many problems for you and understand where you're coming from with your lighting and won't screw you over. They understand what you've got to do for lighting. So, you know, watching someone like Ross work and, and, the, and the whole thing in the, in the so-called hospital car park, which was a downtown deserted thing. I mean, there's a lot of really brilliant operated shots in that. I mean, that took us a week to shoot. And again, you know, Ross was brilliant. And I, Ringo you know, knew what he needed to get the shots. He was very specific. Very specific. It wasn't random. It wasn't, oh, just send it down there and see what happens. He needed to know exactly what was going to happen on every shot. So I learned a lot from Ringo about precision. I can't say that we had a bosom buddy relationship because he wasn't that kind of guy. Although I used to get invited every Sunday to the best, best Chinese restaurant in Vancouver with Jean-Claude and various other you know, friends and ladies, Jean-Claude's ladies or whatever. But, and and you, know, he, we, you wouldn't be paying the bill and it would be the best stuff. But even there, Ringo, Ringo, see, tried me. So what, did, what, did, what, what came to the table first that day, the first time I had lunch with him, was, um, you know, um, hen's feet, fried hen's feet. Now, you know, a lot of people go, Ugh. and I, you know, I like my food, and I don't have much of a problem, so I just picked them up and started gnawing on them, and they're delicious. In terms of the, the lighting, um, I would say, as always, you go, you take the idea to the director, um, and absolutely Ringo said yes to everything. There was never a question that I wasn't delivering on what Ringo wanted and delivering not on what Ringo asked for. In other words, Ringo didn't have to tell me much. You know, that scene where, we, uh, where Jean-Claude goes to meet Jean-Claude down that corridor and it's lit by one light off a car headlight. That's how we... I said, that's what I want to do. And he said, yeah, go for it. The danger when you do dark stuff... And again, especially on film, where we could never... Now, don't forget, with film, you never knew what you were going to get. You had a monitor, but that monitor was just a, a, a television tube stuck on the end of the camera. It didn't tell you anything about what the film was getting. You only knew the following day when it had been processed. And because darkness was the most difficult thing to do on film, because it can be a slightly different temperature in the lab that night. Your film might go through at the end, when the developer is a little bit weak, hasn't quite been you know, kept up to strength. And if you're working right on the dark end of film emulsion, it can really sabotage you. It can stab you in the back. So you tended to be conservative either one way or the other. A lot of DPs would overlight out of sheer worry that they're going to get 
that it's going to let them down. Or you do what I did, was I always tended to overexpose the film. Not, not overexpose it with light, but I would make sure that what, was, what is known as a thick negative. And the thick negative is where you brought the exposure up in the shadows and you know the highlights are going to hold. And you rely on the lab to print what's known as printing it down back to the darkness. And that way, you know you've got your shadows covered. But you need a director, again, who understands what you're going to do because that first dailies that come off the following day, everything is lifted up because you've probably given it another half. But Ringo understood printing down. He'd done so many pictures in, Hol in Hong Kong where you know they shot at the end of a day and it had been crazy and the lighting had been awful and he knew what you can do with printing. So, again, you know, that whole visual look. And it, I, was, I was quite surprised when I looked at it today, actually, how I, I'd sort of... I think it had disintegrated a bit in my brain, the look. And when I looked at it today, I thought, you know, this is, none of this is at all shabby. I'm really pleased with it. I'm glad, I'm glad you've asked for this interview because it allowed me to go back and look at something that I haven't looked at for a long, long time. And overlaid on that is we have motion control. Many of those shots we would shoot with three passes with the camera controlled. So, uh, you know, Ross would operate the first part of the shot. The camera would remember that operating. Then we would then change all the lighting, like in the house with the flashbacks. We would change the camera speed because we wanted to step print it. And I underexposed it by, I think, four stops and then had that part of the negative printed up or no, overdeveloped to bring up grain so that we had a real difference between the reality and the flashbacks. But it was all done on a motion control camera. So one was able to go from one to the other with the camera moving. And of course, with a motion control camera, um, everything is, 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 is controlled by the computer after the first run. But of course, that puts a big onus on a director because it takes time. And there's some beautiful blends in that. And I don't, I get, well, once again, I may be wrong, but I don't think any of those were put together digitally. I think they were all film to film at that point. I'm not sure there was digital effects at that point, but I could be wrong. But I think if you check the credits, there are no digital effects in it. I think that Jean-Claude um, respected Ringo very much. And maybe that's that whole power play that happened on that sequence I described to you when we first saw the first stunt guys, and that was in the pre-production days. So I think, you know, there was no question of who was the boss. There probably had been a talking to from Ringo that there could be no um, misbehaviour um, that would affect the shooting schedule. In other words, no partying. I think that we always had... I think we had Sundays off only, I think... So I think that sort of we would probably not do a night shoot on a Saturday to give John Claude a chance to let his hair down. But we never had any problems with John Claude. Michael was great to work with, an absolute bundle of energy. Um, Kathleen, Catherine, Catherine, I think. You know, she didn't have a lot to do in this picture because I think, don't think Ringo would probably be described as a woman's director. And there was this street, this, this sort of area called East Hastings, down by the river. And the first time I'd ever went there, a friend, the screenwriter on Final Cut said, oh, I've got a play on. And it's in this little theatre called The Fire Station. And it's down near East Hastings. And it's a fire station that they turned into a theatre. And I didn't, you know, no one said anything, so I just drove down there in my car because I was staying on the other side of Vancouver. And I parked the car up some streets from the theatre and decided to walk. And I thought, what, what have I put myself into? I had never been... And I'd been in some bad places. I'd been in Avenue A and B, A and B in New York during the, during the crack crisis down there. I'd never seen anything like East Hastings. It was medieval. It was people crawling on all floors. Everybody was the colour of grey. There were people shooting up in alleyways. And when I got to the theatre, I said to Raoul Inglis, the, who's a writer, who was invited me, I said, well, you should have told me about it. And they said, oh, we never, we, never, said we never tell people about East Hastings because they'll never go down there if they, if they 
hear what it's like. So anyway, so when it came to finding a hotel that was meant to be some sort of sleazy hotel that the hooker took him back to, um, we went on a location, we went on a recce, a location recce, and we were taken by the location manager into East Hastings, which I was very used to. And we were told, thick boots, gloves, don't touch anything. <laughs> Ringo loved that particular place. We, sh we used the staircase and all of that. Um, <clears throat> so what we had to do with that was that after, well, first of all, in went a team with hazmat stuff on. All the residents were turned out, which I felt very, very um, not pleased with, but I was told that they were looked after somewhere else. And then the crew went in, this ha went in hazmat, and basically took everything out of those rooms disinfected everything and then art department bought in clean needles and clean this and clean that and dressed it. I mean the irony of the film business and it was fascinating to be inside one of those old rooming houses from the turn of the century because you know they were there for the railway labour and if you used to if you went to Chinatown in Vancouver you could see these famous houses famous place rooms which have half floors like the hotel, in, like the, the building in Being John Malkovich, because they had dormitory floors where people would walk stoop to get to their bed, Chinese, Chinese workers on the railroads. And this rooming house is very much for the sort of, for the Caucasian railway workers to work. Very cheap, multiply occupied, but it was a great location to shoot. And that staircase works very well. The furnace caused a big problem <clears throat> because the first time we lit it up with everybody there, suddenly people started saying, I've got to go outside for a moment. And then people started eyes boarding. And then, then we, started getting, uh, uh, we started getting coughing. And we realised that whatever the furnace had been built of, and of course all it was was a gas burner, which we switched on for the event, but we had lights in there that we could use when we weren't, didn't actually see the flame. But in heating up the material that they'd used to build the furnace with, which was basically a thin aluminium plate, there was obviously something on the plate which was giving off fumes. And this is a perfect example where a unionised place to work has safeguards for the workers because all they had to do was make one call and an IRC representative came in with, a, with some device and said, OK, this has to be sorted out. Nobody's allowed to work here until it's sorted out. And Ringo got really pissed off at that because that wasn't what he was used to in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, they would have given everybody a, a bad mask and goggles and carried on shooting. I think it belongs where it belongs. I think it is, you know, I, I, I've been sort of playing around with an idea of doing a one-hour film, which is basically, that's not the title, but it's what I saw. <laughs> and starting from my earliest, all the way through a sort of a montage, it's almost a Julian Temple film in a way. And without explanation, starting off from day one with the camera, and just kind of putting stuff together. I've no idea yet if it would say, a lot of people have said to me from the experience, oh, you should write a book. I don't want to write a book. I can't stand these kind of things. And then I did this and then I did that. There's no, there's no interest whatsoever. I'm always interested in mentoring people and bringing my experience to that mentoring to other cinematographers. Partly because the reason we have the British Society of Cinematographers, the reason we have the American Society and the reason why we have these society of cinematographers right across the world is that cinematographers are quite a rare breed. These societies are not unions, they are guilds. And they're guilds who are based on the idea not of exclusivity, but actually inclusivity. And to move the craft on, but to respect who was before you. In the way that actually artists do, painters particularly, painters happily go back and back and back and find things in a Rembrandt or a, 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 a Giacometti or a Giotto that they can then, and it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not copying, it's not appropriation, it is inspiration. And so consequently, that's what I feel is that all of this is about my story as a cinematographer. And that's what it only needs to be. <clears throat> so everything is relevant, even the worst films. And there is, you know, there are, there, there's, there's two, I won't even mention them out of respect for the director, but there's two horrible turkeys. They are dreadful. 
One, I, one was I was parachuted in at like vast cost to try and keep it running, uh, where the DP had taken so many drugs they locked him in the room. And, you know, it was, it was I just, I, I, and I walked in and I was told by some, some arsehole producers that I had to fire everybody. And I said, well, let's hang on, show me, I want to look at all the dailies. And when I saw the dailies, I thought, I saw the problem it wasn't the crew, it was the DP, who was obviously completely off his head. Um, so the first thing I did was call that crew together and said, now, look, guys, you know, uh, I'm trying to be quite, not say where it all was. It was certainly not in America or Canada or here. And I said to them, you are not going to be fired. I said, what I've seen is I think I've understood the problem. But what I'm going to need from you now is openness. And if you've got a problem, you come and tell me. You know, and we did. We completed the film. At all, you know, the producers weren't paying people. It was one of those productions. You know, uh, you know my, my agent said, if you, if you want, you, wear, we want, you want him tomorrow, then she, you, you give him a first class flight. And she luckily checked the morning of my flight and discovered I was in the back of the plane. So she just said, you're not flying. So she understood the breach. And then, you know, suddenly I was told we had five cans of film left. I said, what do you mean? This is a major feature. Ah, uh, well, the producer's coming with some more. But he's suddenly, suddenly the producer had, had developed spine cancer. He's still around. So, I mean, <laughs> but of course, in a way, if you're talking to cinematography students, then it's good to actually have done this sort of stuff because you can then, you can then say, look, this is what you've got to, as a cinematographer, because a cinematographer does a lot of jobs. A cinematographer, it's an, it's an aesthetic job, there's a big aesthetic to it, but it's also organising. It's also handling a budget. It's handling a lot of other departments who come to you for... You know, what does this fabric look like? How's the makeup going? Everybody, you are the pivot. You know, you're trying to keep the director protected from the pressures from the producers as well. You're trying to get the director's vision onto the screen in whichever way that working relationship is. So, and you, you're a diplomat with actors. Often they come to you more than a director. They want to know what it's like for real. And so you've got to have their trust. So you're doing a lot of things on that, you know. And I want to, that's what, when I mentor and when I teach or when I, when I lecture, it is about setting that. The first thing I tell, may, like, for people from the London International Film School, because you're talking about graduates who are then going to film school. So these people are very bright, very motivated. The first thing I tell all of them when we first, when I do these um, workshops every so often, like for three days. And the first thing I say is when I sit down with them, is I say, now, the first thing you've got to do if you want to be a cinematographer is get yourself a good accountant. That's the first thing you've got to do. Because if in two years' time you owe so much tax because you haven't got your final, you're going to take work just to pay your tax bill. But no one ever tells you that on a graduate film course. So that's in a sense where I see all my... But it, but it is a body of work. And it's still continuing. The film I'm making at the moment, I am very proud of. And I've shot most of it myself. I've recorded most of it myself. It's a 90-minute huge film about a huge opera, a Philip Glass opera. And yet, interestingly enough, I would say is that I am not in love with any of the visuals in it because I directed it. Even though I shot it, it's almost as if somebody else shot it. I, I, I'm very ruthless with the material. Nothing has stayed in this film because of how difficult it was to shoot it or because of how it looks. It was absolutely, everything is now sub, is subjugated to the telling of this particular story about this particular singer, his life story, and how he got to the point in this being the lead in this extraordinary opera, this Philip Glass opera, with a voice which is a countertenor. In other words, he sings at the same, the same register as a top soprano does. And it's a film about gender. It's a film about a lot of things. It isn't just a film about opera. It's a film about what do you do with a child prodigy? What do you do as a parent when you realise that probably the child is gay? Because you happen to both be psych psychologists. How do you nurture someone like that? You know, how do you resist as a parent saying, oh, no, you must drop your voice. You must not. How instead what you do is what by, by the nurturing, how you create this extraordinary artist, which is, you know, Anthony Roth Costanza.
And it's a film in a way I'm probably going to be prouder of than anything else because, you know, I've made it against all the odds. Everyone said I shouldn't do it. We had we'd made it for no money and yet we have a full opera. You know, I mean, it's one of those achievements again. And probably the next, uh, there is another interesting arts project coming up. And um, again, I'll be very proud of it. So I, in a way, it's not a question of looking back. It's, it's a question of all these things are valid, aren't they? I mean, I, do, you, do you not think that with all, everything? I know, I know a lot of people's lives can't be as, not, uh, 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 as fulfilled. And I'm very lucky that I've been able to fulfill what is inside of me. But, you know, that's what a body of work is. So I think that replica, and especially by making, you know, by you asking for this interview, you've made me look at it again and made me, I've completely forgotten about it. And there's some, there's some really good photography in it.